in the name of Jesus drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season it is still dry season spiritually financially and otherwise I decree and declare let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall let the rain begin to fall you welcome to another spirit filled message on christocentric message if you're new to this channel i would entreat you to hit on that subscribe button and then to like this video as well i would want you to share this message across because we believe that as this message is coming forth it's going to bless you Her graces are going to be imparted onto you and then god is going to visit your home thank you for watching stay blessed let the river flow, first let it burn inside, hey, and flow outside, hey. Shabalakosa brande balakosa barash. You're still praying in the spirit for a minute or two. Someone is still praying in the spirit for a minute or two. Release that Let worship from within your flow. spirit. Make it a prayer. Let your river flow. Let it burn inside and flow outside. Let your fire fall. Let your river flow. Just let it burn inside of me. Then let it flow outside. It's all about this place. The fire of prayer. The fire of consecration. The fire of consecration. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to realize that something very prophetic is happening in this place. Not just in this place, but over this nation. We are going to be seated shortly, but let me just respond to prophecy. We are going to shout seven hallelujahs. It means halal Yeshua. I sense there is a warring going on in the atmosphere of America right now as I speak. I don't know what it is, but I know that there is something going on politically. Something going on with government, political power. And the instruction I have is to make a prophetic contribution. Listen, listen, please. This is an apostolic and a prophetic ministry where people of discernment, we came by the Spirit to shift something. Hallelujah. The sound of a trumpet always announces a new season. Even the return of Christ will be heralded by the sound of a trumpet. Hallelujah. And so Pastor Nat is going to lead us. He will blast that trumpet prophetically. Not over us. We are prophesying to America now. That whatever is happening in the atmosphere. We are coming as ambassadors. Witnesses. Carriers of fire. Are we together? And so once you hear that blast. We are going to shout hallelujah. It means halal Yeshua. Seven times. And at the seventh time, I'll lead you in that shout. At the seventh time, let there be a shout of victory. The kind of shouts that brought the walls of Jericho down. The kind of shout that destroys everything that is not of God. Who is ready to participate in prophecy? Who is ready to bring down ancient walls? Who is ready to tear down altars that have stood against the progress of the program of God over this nation? Are you ready now? Pass on out, please. Hallelujah. Ready for number three. We're shouting hallelujah. Halal Yeshua. Over America. Number four. Halal Yeshua. The God of Joshua, the one who rides upon the wings of the wind. Number five. 
Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Are you ready for the seven shouts now? Listen, we're going to shout this one together with faith in our hearts. This shout is for America, but it's also for your life. That every wall, every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. You overcome. Hey, every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the victor's crown. Prophesy one time. Every high thing must come down. Every stronghold shall be broken. You wear the Are you ready for this shout now? I want you to see every mountain, financial mountains, mountains of demonic oppressions. The Bible says, who art thou mountain before Zerubbabel, that before Zerubbabel thou shalt be made plain. I want you to release your faith. You're not just acting in the flesh. By this shout for some of you, growths and tumors will die from your body. By this shout, you will be rewriting stories you will overturn court cases do you believe that it's a sound of revival revival is not quiet revival is noisy because when the king arises he arises in power is someone ready for this shout at the blast of the trumpet jump shout do whatever you have to do in the spirit and watch those walls crumble once we are done shouting begin to pray in the spirit for the next one minute are you ready now personal please Not. A few months ago, I was meditating, and while I was in the place of prayer, from the spirit, song began to come into my spirit, and I took my guitar and I began to play. I didn't know that would be an anthem. A capture of a new season in my own life and in this ministry and God has placed such grace something will happen to you as I sing that song breathe Lord breathe breathe Lord breathe breathe upon my life Breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. Will you breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe, Lord, breathe, breathe upon my life. I receive, I manifest. Your power and your wisdom till the nations see Jesus lifted up, exalted. I receive, I manifest your power and your wisdom.
says son of man can these bones live again and he said only ah, who am I prophesying to can this business live again can this ministry live again can your son live again he said only thou knowest and then he says prophesy prophesy and then there was flesh, but there was no life. And then he says, Son of man, prophesy to the four winds and say, O winds, breathe upon this land. And the Bible says, There arose an exceeding great army. We're going to do something very prophetic. Please take it higher for me right now. We're going to do something prophetic in this place right now. And I want you to participate. This is a sound of revival. When we came in, Pastor Nat, that was the day before yesterday, I was praying in the morning. And just, I have the instrumentals of this song. And while I was just listening, something came into my spirit. It was a sound from heaven. And that is the sound that I want to bring forth in this place. Mighty things will happen. Do you believe this? It's a very simple sound.
over America in the name that is above all names every dry bone in the government in your schools across families in the name that is above all names again we decree again we declare as sent ones from God let breath surge into every dead bone now. Let breath, the breath of life, surge into every dead situation now. In the name of Jesus, we declare America, hear the sound of revival. Hear the sound of restoration. Hear the sound of resurrection. Hear the sound of a new season. We declare it's a new season. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Give Jesus praise for one minute. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. In an atmosphere like this, anything is possible. Anything is possible. While Pastor Nat blew the trumpet, something happens to me every time he blows that trumpet. Just connects to my spirit. Just connects to my spirit. Hallelujah. For someone I'm hearing in my spirit for you, weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. There may be an area of concern in your life, but hear this prophetic word. Weep not. Weep not. Weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And there's someone here, you are called into the ministry of prophetic psalmistry. One of the reasons why God brought you here is so that you will connect with deeper fountains. This is what I'm hearing in my spirit. And because you are here tonight by the power that raised Christ from the dead, let that oil like the dew of Hammon, let it rest upon you. Rest upon your ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ. Please be seated. Be seated for a few minutes. Mighty God. Over America. For someone, this will be your spiritual souvenir. You will carry this song as you rejoice. Returning back to your stations is a song of victory. It's a song of celebration. It's a chant of victory. There is an anointing upon it. It's why you see us staying there. Staying there. We've learned how to host his presence. When he stays, we stay. When he moves, we move. When he stays, we stay. When he moves, we move. Mm.
Amen. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm going to be sharing right now. Please, let's honor Pastor Nat so that he can sit. I know he's been standing. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ. I want to teach you this morning. God bless you. I love you too. I want to show you why revivals die. We're considering revival flames. This is part two, the morning session. I'll do a quick recap on what I shared yesterday. And then we'll connect to the new thought for this morning. I want to show you why revivals die. And this is very important, particularly if you're a minister of the gospel here, it's important you understand not just how to ignite revivals, but how to sustain a move of God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. A very quick recap. Yesterday, I began by teaching us how that history is full of time periods where there seems to be an extraordinary move of God across lives, across territories, across nations. We call that a revival. And we said how that a revival is an awakening unto true spirituality, unto righteousness, hallelujah, where people press to love Jesus like never before. They cultivate a zeal for spiritual things. And we call it a reawakening from a state of dormancy. I did teach us yesterday that classically speaking, a revival is always threefold. Number one, a personal revival, it affects an individual. So this is between you and God, a reawakening. Are we together? Number two, revival over the church, the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number three, territorial revival, like we see in Nineveh, like we see you know, in Babylon, and so on and so forth. And um, I did tell us that there is a threefold a tripartite signature to authentic, genuine revival. Please don't forget this, that not every spiritual move can be called a revival. There is an exact requirement that must be met for any move whatsoever to be called a revival. Number one, we said the first feature of a true, authentic, God-ordained revival is that there must be restoration of God consciousness and true spirituality that happens when there is repentance, restoration of holiness, righteousness, and renewed love for Jesus and for spiritual things. Number two, that every genuine revival translates to the multiplication of believers because revivals are souls targeted. It is always targeted at the lost. Hallelujah. Even though the revival happens within the one who is saved, but it is to help that person to be efficient enough to reach the lost. Multiplication of believers. There must be an increase within the community of believers as a result of massive soul winning. We see that happen on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people came to the fold in one day. And then number three, we said a genuine revival must have a territorial expression. There must be territorial transformation captured within a genuine revival. That means a restoration to moral excellence, restoration of values, economic transformation, technological transformation, and so on and so forth. And um, I told us yesterday that every genuine revival is connected to the Great Commission. You remember that? That every genuine revival, every genuine move of God, even that which we expect to happen in America and across the nations of the earth, is connected to the Great Commission. I did not define for you yesterday what the Great Commission is. Just allow me to do that definition and then we'll jump straight to the business of this morning. The Great Commission is defined as a mandate given by Jesus. A mandate given by Jesus. It was first to the disciples and now it extends to all believers. I'll take it again. A mandate given by Jesus. 
initially to the disciples, but now to all believers to reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. That's the first component. To reach the entire globe with the gospel of salvation. Number two, to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship. The first dimension or the first compartment of this mandate is to bring the entire globe to the saving knowledge of Jesus by communicating the gospel of salvation. Next is to bring nations to the knowledge of the truth through discipleship. And then finally to bring territorial and societal transformation. These are the threefold dimensions that are captured in the Great Commission. So we have world evangelization, number one. Number two, we have transformation through discipleship. And then number three, we have territorial impact. It's important that you broaden your understanding of the Great Commission because for the average believer, our understanding of the Great Commission just stops at soul winning. And while that is correct, that is not complete. The Great Commission has a threefold expression. Number one, soul winning. The global harvest, bringing nations to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And that happens by articulately communicating the gospel. And then number two, discipling nations. Jesus said that in Matthew chapter 28. Not just to preach, but to mentor, to disciple nations. Hallelujah. And then number three, territorial transformation. When God is moving, the territory should know. And you know that territorial transformation is beyond just innovations. It is a battle for the spirits and the mind of people. Because everything that happens within a territory is a reflection of the thinking, the belief systems of the people. So the gospel has two components to it. There is the message that saves, but there is the value system that transforms society. It is important that we emphasize not just the message that saves, but the value system that transforms society. Are we learning? So for everyone who desires to see revival, genuine, authentic, lasting revival, it is important that we return back to the mandate, the Great Commission. Now, within the mandate, there are other expressions. When you teach on favor, when you teach on prosperity, there's no time would have gone to Psalm 103. The Bible lists there five or six benefits. So salvation has benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul, it says, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And then it says, forget not his benefits. The emphasis is to focus on the Lord. But in doing so, he says, forget not his benefits. And the Bible begins to list a few benefits. Number one, who forgiveth thine iniquities. Number two, who healeth, you know, your body, your sickness. Number three, who delivereth you from every destruction. Number four, he crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. And all of that, there are about five of them. So the things that have occupied our pulpits in terms of doctrinal content, in terms of our emphasis. They are very important, but what we need to do is to bring back the mandate, the Great Commission. It is important to teach people on prosperity, important to teach people on living in victory, relational principles, administrative principles. All of these components are important, but in order of priority, all those teachings should not be at the risk of their understanding the mandate. Soul winning. Discipleship that brings transformation. And then impact upon society. You're understanding me so far? Shout a loud amen. amen. Alright, so let's take it a step further now very quickly. And examine why revivals fail. I've studied the subject of revival a bit. And... Um, First for myself and then to learn ancient principles 
for igniting and sustaining a genuine move of God. And in my study, I stumbled across a few factors that have been responsible for the death of many mighty moves. And America, please listen. As much as we have celebrated many moves of God, as much as we have come to ignite another revival, it's important that we know how to sustain the fire, the flames of revival. Hallelujah. Are we learning? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul makes a very interesting statement. He says there is this treasure in earthen vessels. Someone say earthen vessels. One more time say earthen vessels. So there is this treasure. But there is a problem here that the treasure is locked up within an earthen vessel. Hallelujah. There is this treasure, but that the treasure is locked up within earthen vessels. I wrote something here and then I want you to please listen. Revivals are ignited and sustained across territories to the degree to which God finds yielded, aligned and trained vessels. Revivals are ignited and revivals are sustained within any territory. That includes America. That includes every and any nation connecting. Revivals are only ignited and sustained when God finds available, yielded, and trained vessels. Available, yielded, and trained vessels. One more time available, yielded, and trained vessels. So when you find a territory bankrupt of a move of God, a genuine awakening, most times it is not because God is hesitant as far as reaching to his people. God's vulnerability over man is not left in the dark. The Bible is clear as to the fact that he always desires to reach down to man right from the Garden of Eden. The Bible says, and the Lord came down walking in the cool of the day. And he said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard your voice, but I hid because I was naked. And he says, who told you you were naked? God's vulnerability over man is clear from scripture. I have loved you with an everlasting love and with my loving kindness, I have drawn you. He always desires to reach down to his people, to reconnect them to grace, to glory, to power, to see that they make progress in their lives. So when it looks like the heavens are closed over people, over families, over territories, over nations. It is not to say God's hands um, are not able to be outstretched towards those people. It is that most times, most times, he's yet to find available, yielded, and trained vessels. Please do not forget these expressions. Available. You can be available and yet not yielded. You can be yielded and yet not trained. You need to be available, you need to be yielded, and you need to be trained. Can we say that together? Say available. Someone say I'm available. Number two, you need to be yielded. Say I am yielded. And now through this conference, you're subjecting yourself to this apostolic training. That tells me, surely, that you will be that vessel that will carry that flame, that revival fire. Do you believe that? Amen. So the move of God depends on available, yielded, and trained vessels. Now, I helped you understand a spiritual progression yesterday, and I want to do a quick recap on that. The average believer must understand the journey, the spiritual progression. How do we evolve in the spirit? from being an unbeliever until we become witnesses. The end point, the end product in a believer's journey is that we become manifestations of the glory of God, but that we also become witnesses. So Jesus finds ordinary men, some fishers, 
some, you know, involved in business of all sorts, some confused, and he begins to walk them through this pathway until they finally evolve to be mighty apostles, evangelists, witnesses. So let me walk you through for one minute and please lend me your attention. Number one, the journey that leads to a witness, the kind of vessel that can be used to sponsor a revival, it always starts with the unbeliever. The state of being an unbeliever is a default state. Are we together? The psalmist said, in iniquity did my mother conceive me. Scripture says, all men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So from birth, unfortunately, as a product of the original sin, the Bible teaches that all men, all men by default, outside of their encounter with Jesus, the son of the living God, all men are lost already. No matter how well intentioned, no matter how sincere you are, once you are yet to encounter Jesus, the son of the living God, the Bible says you are spiritually dead. You may be sincere, you may be a nice person, loving person, very kind, but spiritually speaking. So Jesus said it this way, I am come that ye may have life. If you had it, you would not come to give you and that you have that life more abundantly. He was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his then only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his son into the world, are we together, to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that that person shall be saved. And John taught us in his epistle that this is the record, are we still together? That God had given us eternal life and that that life is in his son. So that whoever encounters the son has life. Are we learning now? So everyone you see who has not met Jesus no matter how sincere, no matter how wonderful, how morally right, the Bible describes such a man to be in a state of death spiritually. Now, when you encounter Jesus through what we call the new birth experience, by confessing his lordship over your life and receiving of his life, a transition happens, Paul taught us. Are we learning now that we... We transit from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And there is a new name and a new status we have immediately. We are called believers. We are called believers. We are called believers. Not yet witnesses, but we are called believers. Are we learning now? So the journey starts from being an unsaved person. Now a saved person. But there is still a problem with this one. Because... It's important for you to know that at the point of initial salvation, only your spirit encounters that life. That salvation experience does not impart upon your mind. And because man is tripartite, it's important that the riches of salvation pours into your entire tripartite being. Are we together? So you would find out that someone who just confessed the Lordship of Christ, the wrong thoughts are still there, the wrong thinking is still there, the stronghold still there, the limitations there, but the person is saved because salvation is a gift. Are we together? Salvation does not require transformation. It is salvation that brings transformation. Salvation simply requires that you believe that report and receive by faith. So here is the believer, level one, or the unbeliever. Then by confessing the lordship of Jesus, you become a believer. But if you leave that believer in that state, he becomes a carnal believer and an inefficient one. Do you know why? Because God cannot do much with such an individual. His mind is still unfruitful to spiritual things. In fact, the only reason why you would know that person was saved was because probably you saw the person making the altar call. Nothing about the life of that person will reflect the glory of God because transformation is yet to happen. Are we together? So once an individual becomes saved, please listen, the next assignment is he's introduced to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Word of God and in partnership with a teaching priest. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit 
in partnership with the written word and in partnership with a teaching priest, they now begin the journey of transformation. Someone shout it, say transformation. One more time, say transformation. Transformation is defined as the process that makes you become like Christ in experience. It's called transformation. So the Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 12 when you read 1 and 2 it says, I beseech thee brethren by the message of God that you offer your bodies unto God a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. He calls it your reasonable act of service. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. Is the Greek word aeon. The thinking pattern that comes with this system. Then it says, be ye transformed. Are we still here? And that by the renewing of your mind. Be ye transformed. So this is the journey. I submit to you that the most difficult phase in the believer's evolution is the journey of transformation. The reason is because transformation is not a gift. It depends on your partnership with the Holy Spirit. You can decide to resist his transformation. And because he's not a demon spirit, he will respect you. So the face and the level in the spirit you should have attained after a year or two because of your refusal to cooperate with him through that transformative process. After 10 years, you can still be a babe in the spirit. A church goer but a babe. Even a pastor but a babe. And the Bible says a babe, a child now is unfruitful in spiritual things. Someone say transformation. One more time shout it say transformation. So I agree that you are a believer. I do not doubt your salvation experience. But are you on that journey to transformation? There are evidences. Evidences to transformation like you will be learning. The first evidence that you are transformed is that you begin to cultivate what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, it says, which was also in Christ Jesus. The excellence of the believer as far as your faith walk is not just dependent on the health of your spirit, but your extent of transformation. Many, many believers are saved, but they are not transformed. And this is why God cannot do much with them. Again, I repeat, many believers are saved, but they have refused to contend for transformation. Either because they do not understand the life-giving, transforming ministry of the Holy Spirit, either because they have rejected the Word of God and its power to purify, to change, to transform or they have rejected the ministry of a teaching priest. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15 says, and I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. It says they shall feed you with wisdom, wisdom and with knowledge. Is someone learning? So let's, let's follow our progression again. So an unbeliever becomes a believer even though a carnal one immature, unfruitful in spiritual things and by the ministry of the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Word of God and a teaching priest, that journey to transformation begins. Now something happens when you make progress here. Something happens. When you become commendably transformed, you move to the next phase. It's called empowerment. Empowerment is useless to a believer who is not transformed. Listen carefully. Empowerment is useless to a believer who is not transformed. Unfortunately, and with all due respect, the Pentecostal charismatic circle, we talk a lot about the anointing. We like the anointing. We like power. The reason why we fall and stand and fall and stand and roll and shout and there's no evidence of growth is because our attention is on power, not transformation. Jesus was not in a hurry to lay hands, nor impart, nor release the Spirit upon people. Look at the ratio of transformation to empowerment. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. If you're a man of God here, let me advise you. Do not be in a hurry to impart the anointing. The vessel matters. When the vessel is small, it makes the oil look small. 
the oil will always assume the shape of the vessel. So she comes to the prophet and the prophet said, what do you have in your house? He said, nothing except a little cruise. And the prophet said, the problem is not the oil. The vessel, go and borrow vessels. Expand your capacity in the spirit. He says, borrow not a few. As soon as there were more vessels, the oil started multiplying. Say transformation. The name given to the process that makes you become like Jesus in experience. I am amazed at the fact that when Jesus became a man, not even him was imparted as a child. Jesus, he had to wade through the journey of 30 years. But the first thing he did from age 12 was to go to the temple and he was learning, even though he was the word incarnate. The value of his impartation, receiving the spirit, came upon the fact that he had now been transformed. And the test of his transformation would follow his encounter with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he was driven to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Satan comes to him and Jesus replies by saying, it is written. That is the signature of a transformed believer. You have come to honor what is written greater than what you have seen or you are seeing, greater than what you are hearing or you've heard. Someone say it is written. Yeah. So an unbeliever becomes a carnal, immature believer and then through growth, you become transformed. Then transformation makes way for empowerment. Now hear this. At the point you are empowered, your name changes from a believer to a witness. You see that you don't just become a witness because you are a Christian. There are many Christians who are not witnesses. A witness is a validator. It's a legal expression. And I, I, I don't want to bore you with all of that. A witness is only needed in court if there is contention. The assignment of the witness is to bring validation to a statement. Am I right on that? So when God calls us witnesses, we are not just mere believers. It means we have been empowered, number one, by the mind of Christ, the truth of scripture. And then number two, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now he can send us. It is only a witness that can be used to bring revival. Not the believer. The believer is in Christ, but cannot be used as an agent of revival. You see why we have so many believers in church, so many believers in America with all due respect, and yet the move of God seems to be in trickles. It is because we have not transited through growth, transformation, and empowerment to become witnesses. Someone is evolving in this conference to a witness. Say amen. I say to you again that someone is evolving in this conference to be a witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Abraham had begun his walk with God, but his name did not change. He was still Abraham, even though he was with God. But the time came when a transition happened and he was changed to Abraham, the father of nations. A transition always happens and with that, your name would change. Same thing happened to Jacob. From Jacob, he now became Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God. I'm praying for someone here. In the name of Jesus, the level of transformation that will allow for profitable empowerment. May you begin that journey with the Holy Spirit. For someone, God is answering you right now. Why you see yourself having dreams, prophetic encounters, and you see yourself on crusade grounds, doing mighty things for the kingdom, but physically you never seem to step into that prophecy. God, the version of you the anointing is looking for is not this version. There is a version of you the oil is looking for. And every time the grace of God comes to you, it finds an unrenewed version. And the oil will have to wait patiently until you grow. Someone tell yourself, myself grow. Myself grow. Prophesy, myself grow. Grow. Become transformed. So that you will become that vessel. Are we still learning? Remember I told you that the move of God, the program of God, territorial transformation, revival, happens when God finds 
available, aligned, and trained vessels. And so I'm walking you through the pathway that is starts by default for all men as unbelievers unsaved. Then you transit to a believer, albeit an immature one, void of spiritual intelligence. And through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in partnership with the written word and a teaching priest, they are enhancers to your transformation. Then you get to a point of maturity in the spirit. You are furnished understanding the ways of God. Now that gives way to spiritual empowerment. And that happens by the spirit of God. At the point of empowerment, you assume a new status in the spirit. You are not called a believer, even though you are still a believer. But the new status is a witness. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says you shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses. Validators. Validators. Validators of my claim. And then, notice, he never defines jurisdiction for believers. But the moment he mentions the ministry of witness, he now says, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. Let me show you how witnesses function. Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. The Bible tells us that a very potent witness called Philip, he went down to Samaria. Witness is always location dependent. And the Bible says there he preached Christ unto them. Then it says the people gave heed with one accord, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There were extraordinary manifestations of God's power. Are we together? And then the next verse says there was joy. There was joy in the city. It always affects the territory when you are a witness. A true witness does not stop um, with your personal progress. If all you have to show us as far as your Christian work is concerned is that I'm doing well, the word of God is working for me, my children are doing well, I'm happy, I'm prospering, I'm loving God, you are still a believer, you are not yet a witness. You cannot be used to fan the flames of revival because the moment you transit to become a witness, it no longer becomes about you. You see, the burden of being a witness is that self dies as God's program grows through your life. So it's no longer about you. You have learned the rudiments that keep you healthy, strong, healed. Now you focus on God's program. The language of a witness is that I took this city for Jesus. I took this territory for Jesus. And there are two elements that I use to describe a witness. One is light. The other is salt. Not to bore you, but there's something interesting about light. Light does not have to be everywhere to shine. You can place light from one point and it can shine all across. So the Bible says, let your light. The word let means permit, allow. Do not hinder. Let your light so shine before men. Help those under the anointing. Let your light so shine before men. Are we together? Then he says, you are salt. The thing I like about salt is that the moment it gets into the pot, it changes, you don't see it again. To know there's salt there, you have to taste the food. The moment you drop salt, it dissolves, but it is not weak. And the thing about salt is that it is never too late to add salt. Never too late to add salt. Hmm. Are we learning? So when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, you step into a system and sometimes you look very frail, but you begin to influence the system. Your first spoon taking your meal and you know there's salt here. He says we are light and we are salt. So one last time, let me walk you through that journey. An unbeliever 
to an immature believer to a transformed believer to an empowered believer to a witness can we run it one more time an unbeliever next is an immature believer a babe an infant in the spirit even though saved then through the journey of transformation that person becomes a transformed believer am i right on that next is empowerment an empowered believer then an empowered believer becomes a witness there's no point knowing your assignment or knowing your kingdom assignment when you are any other thing but a witness it will be useless to know what god has called you to do if you don't contend to be a witness because you will only know it and it remains there you will never be able to act it out there are many people like Jeremiah, right from infancy, God showed them what he's desired to do in and through their lives. But because most believers think the journey is from being an unbeliever to an infant, then a witness. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. And longevity in the faith does not automatically make you a witness. You have to engage. So don't tell me you've been saved for 20 years. Have you transited? Have you transited? An individual can be saved and based on his passion and his hunger, like it is resting on someone now, in one year, that individual can leap with the spirit and become so transformed, he can end the status of a 20-year-old believer, a product of hunger. The moment you get saved, listen carefully, no other thing in your experience is a gift again. Every other thing depends on your engaging. The initial salvation is a gift given to all men. But your journey from that point, the enablement comes from God. But you have to cooperate and partner with the Spirit. Who is understanding me so far? This explains why we have many churches but powerless believers. Every time you see a powerless believer, don't think power. What is wrong is transformation. Once transformation is right, power does not delay. It rests quickly. In fact, there are many people who do not pray for power. They just get to the edge of transformation and collide with authentic, genuine apostolic power. Are we together? The disciples never requested from Jesus to be empowered. They just submitted to transformation. Their empowerment was his idea. Hmm. That means in the program of God, my brother, my sister, listen carefully. There is a version of you an anointing is waiting for. And that anointing can wait for all your lifetime and never rest on you. The anointing is waiting right here. But for 10 years, even though having dreams about revivals, you have decided to stay here. Going to church every Sunday but remaining here. Hmm. And the spirit keeps crying. There is so much I want to do with you. You even desire the more of God. But for most people, we have not been educated spiritually to understand these transitory systems. My assignment this morning is to walk you through because represented all of these levels, all of these faces are captured in this auditorium and to the many who are falling. For many, unfortunately, many, even in America, they are still unsaved. They don't need transformation. They don't need empowerment. You don't transform an unsaved person. It's a waste. A natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit. It will not even profit him. So laboring to teach and do a lecture or a conference and education to someone who is not saved is a waste of time. I hope you know that spiritual knowledge is not like secular information. You can understand your schoolwork with intelligence. There are people who are smart. But when it has to do with this spirit business, your organs of interaction with the spirit has to be activated by the presence of the life of God. If that software is not activated, you can even be a professor and you will only listen to spiritual things intellectually and they will never make sense. For instance, there is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. There is he that withholdeth more than his meat and tends to poverty. That is against common sense. It is against logic. For instance, to dance your way out of trouble. No, you call the police out of, your, out of trouble. 
Yet in the spirit, Paul and Silas at midnight, the Bible says that they prayed, they sang, and everyone heard them suddenly. An unbeliever, a babe in the spirit, barely saved but confused about life and destiny, not understanding anything spiritual whatsoever. A churchgoer, convenient if it's fine, if it's not, then doesn't matter. Then one who has begun a journey with the Holy Spirit, intentionally, the journey to transformation, then empowerment and your name changes. And you become a witness. It is at this point that Saul turns to Paul. It is at this point that Cephas becomes Peter. Thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Hello beloved in Christ. We hope this message was a blessing to you. I would want you to do something for us. If you are new here, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this video as well. Share to your family and friends to bless them because we know that this message will be a blessing to their body, to their soul, and to their spirit. We would need you to do one thing for us too. Tell us in the comment section where you were watching us from. And then if you've got any testimony for us, kindly share with us. Thank you for watching. In the name of Jesus, drought in your life that even when it is physical rainy season, it is still dry season spiritually, financially and otherwise. I decree and declare, let the rain begin to fall. Let the rain begin to fall. Let the rain 